Right now on Morning News Now, a Super Tuesday showdown between Donald Trump and Nikki Haley on the heels of a Supreme Court ruling to keep Trump on Colorado's primary ballot. The voters can take the person out of the race very quickly, but a court shouldn't be doing that, and the Supreme Court saw that very well. Look, I'll defeat Donald Trump fair and square, but I want him on that ballot. We have team coverage as the polls open on what's shaping up to be the most consequential day of the election season so far. Also this morning, no deal. Another round of ceasefire talks between Israel and Hamas ending without a breakthrough as the U.N. sounds the alarm on the horrors of war in Gaza. Meanwhile, the U.S. downplaying the vice president's sharp stance against the fighting will bring you the latest. Plus, wide out on the West Coast, Californians digging out of several feet of snow, while on the East Coast, we are tracking downpours. We'll bring you the forecast. And putting the r, &R back in spring break. That's right, put the map and itinerary away. More vacationers are opting to do less and relax more on vacation. We'll unpack the do-nothing travel trend that's making waves this year. Is that your kind of vacation? Some would just call that vacation. Yeah. <laughs> but it has become increasingly harder and harder to unplug, so it's right. good to see the trend moving toward. No, And it's I'm a little not. more like laying on a beach than touring a city. Exactly. And also know? fascinating, the sabbatical thing is also becoming a new thing. So Especially we'll, with younger people, yeah. Exactly. We'll dig into that. Good to have you with us on this Super Tuesday. I'm Joe Fryer. Hello, here we go. I'm Savannah Sludge. We're going to get started this morning, of course, with this big day in the race for the White House. Today is Super Tuesday with voting taking place in more than a dozen states. That means more than a third of all delegates will be up for grabs today. With a strong showing today, Republican frontrunner, former President Donald Trump, will move closer to becoming his party's nominee. His challenger for Former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley is staying in the race even though she has won just one contest so far. She campaigned yesterday in Texas, which is one of the states voting today, telling supporters that casting a ballot is crucial in this primary fight. Courage for me to run and courage for every one of you to know. Don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't play in this primary. It matters. We do have the results of the final contest ahead of Super Tuesday. NBC News projects Donald Trump has won the North Dakota Republican caucuses, inching himself closer to the nomination. And by winning more than 60 percent of the vote, as you can see on your screen well, more than 60 percent, Trump is set to win all 29 of the state's delegates. We have full team coverage this morning of Super Tuesday, including NBC News reporter Gary Grumbach and NBC News campaign in bed Emma Barnett at polling locations in Virginia and Massachusetts. Let's begin with NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. Mark, good morning. So today is the biggest single voting day in the primary season. Nearly 900 delegates up for grabs. What's at stake here today, especially for Haley, whose campaign is looking for any kind of momentum after winning D.C. over the weekend? Yeah, Joe, at stake, I think, is the reality of the delegate math in this Republican race. And as you ended up mentioning, there are 865 delegates that are up for grabs in tonight's contest. And on Donald Trump's best night, he might end up getting 800 out of that 865 due to many of the delegate allocation rules that effectively these states become winner take all if you get 50% or more from the contest. Nikki Haley's best night, she uh, might be able to hold Donald Trump to fewer than uh, 700 uh, delegates. Uh, and uh, But that just kind of shows you the scale that even if she does super, super well tonight and exceeds expectations, she will trail Donald Trump significantly in the delegate race for the Republican presidential nomination. So as we've been discussing, though, Mark, former President Trump is the heavy favorite to win all the races today. What are some of the things we should be watching for as the results start to pour in tonight, as he potentially heads toward that 800? Yeah, uh, Savannah, my baseline is about the national polls that we've seen in the Republican presidential contest after the South Carolina primary, where Donald Trump leads her by about 80, 80 point, by 80 to 20 margin. And so we're going to see if that kind of holds up throughout the contest tonight. Now, there are some of these open primaries that allow independents as well as crossover Democrats to participate. And so I'm going to be looking for some states like Virginia, for example, or Massachusetts, where Nikki Haley 
might be able to overperform and give Donald Trump a closer contest. But overall, I think the expectation is that Donald Trump will probably end up emerging victorious in all uh, of, of the contests. Those are the two states we'll check in with in just a moment. So, Mark, with every passing day, it looks more and more likely we're going to see this Biden-Trump rematch this fall. Recent polls show Mr. Trump leading President Biden. Some of those polls are within the margin of error. Will either candidate be able to really become their party's presumptive nominee after tonight? I mean, at what point could this really shift to a one-on-one -on -one general election match? Joe, technically, we're not going to get to that presumptive nominee phase, uh, most likely until later this month. The magic number of the Republican race is 1,215 delegates. And even if Donald Trump does super, super well and gets almost all of the delegates, he's not going to come close to that number. He will in the weeks ahead, however. Uh, but effectively, Joe, we have actually been kind of in this stage heading towards an inevitable Donald Trump versus President. Joe Biden showdown, uh, and uh, the math at least gets us that stage later this month. All right, Mark, thank you so much. Well, for perspective from voters, let's bring in NBC News reporter Gary Grumbach, who is in Henrico County, Virginia, which is just north of Richmond, and NBC News political embed Emma Barnett, who is in Needham, Massachusetts. Good morning to you both, Gary. I will get started with you. So Virginia has this open primary. That means voters don't have to be registered as a Republican to vote in the Republican primary. Is that expected to have an impact on the results there? Hey, good morning, guys. Yeah, voters are voting here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Polls have been open for about an hour here. And voters here in Virginia tend to have an ability to surprise with their vote. Think back to 2021, when Governor Glenn Youngkin ended up beating out establishment Terry McAuliffe for the governorship here in Virginia. So we're looking at two places where the voters may surprise here in Virginia. First, among independents. Where do these swing voters, where do these independents end up? Because as you mentioned, it is an open primary. That means they walk into the building behind me, they pick a ballot they want to choose, whether it's Republican or Democrat, and they can be any party they want. They can then choose that ballot and pick their candidate. The other group that we're looking at is going to be among Democrats. Democrats don't have to vote for Joe Biden today. They can actually go and vote for Nikki Haley or Donald Trump or a write-in candidate as well. So we'll be looking at those numbers very closely this evening. Gary, as you are in a spot where former President Trump has not typically done so well over the years. What are you hearing from voters so far there today? So we are in Henrico County. It's a little bit north of the state capital, Richmond, here in Virginia. And we are actually already heard uh, from all three sides of the ticket here. We've heard from Nikki Haley voters. We've heard from Donald Trump voters. And I've even heard from uh, Joe Biden voters as well. As you can imagine, what you're hearing lines up with what we've heard over the past several months. Nikki Haley voters say they want to return to a little bit more of normal and governorship uh, and, 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 and how it works there. Donald Trump voters tell me they don't believe the election in 2020 was uh, accurate. They don't believe the election in 2020 was fair, and they want to see it become fair. They want to see the economy get better. Joe Biden voters say they like what they've seen so far. They want to see more of the same. Guys. Emma, let's bring you in here. Emma, who, by the way, was on the producing team of this show and now is on this show. So you go, girl. She's in Massachusetts, where 63 percent of voters are unenrolled, which means they can vote in either primary. So as we've seen, this unaffiliated group of voters, that's this huge target for Nikki Haley and potentially in some places a huge opportunity for her. What are you hearing on the ground there? Savannah, that is exactly right. That 63% is key for Nikki Haley because here in Massachusetts, only approximately 8% of voters are registered Republicans. So the Haley team is looking at that 63% and are hopeful that people will choose to vote in the more competitive primary this cycle, which is the Republican primary. However, there is a caveat, and that caveat is that if you are an unenrolled voter here in Massachusetts, you're not necessarily going to be voting in the Republican primary. As I've been speaking to people here in the state, a lot of them tell me that they are either going to be voting for Trump today or for Joe Biden today. And that just shows the level of apathy that voters here have towards what they see as the inevitable, which is this Trump versus Biden rematch. One thing that I will point out is the Nikki Haley voters that I have been speaking to here in Massachusetts really do not want to see a Trump versus Joe Biden rematch. And they've told me that if it comes to it in the general election, they will do 
one of three things. They will either leave the top of the ticket blank, they will write in Nikki Haley's name, or they will vote for a third party. Joe and Savannah. So, Emma, what seems to be on voters' minds when it comes to issues as they head to the polls this morning and as they look ahead to November? Joe and I talk to voters here in Massachusetts, especially Republican voters. The number one issue I am hearing time and time again is immigration. Now, you might be thinking, well, Massachusetts is pretty far from the southern border, and geographically, that is true. However, Massachusetts is home to a number of sanctuary cities, so the migrant crisis directly impacts people here in the state. So when voters are choosing those unenrolled, that 63 percent that may be choosing to vote in a Republican primary, the the thought process behind that is it is a referendum against the Biden administration's immigration policies. Joe and Savannah. All right, Emma and Gary, thank you both very much. And we will have coverage of Super Tuesday, of course, throughout the day here on NBC News Now. And then our extensive live coverage gets underway at 5 p.m. Eastern to Pacific. Tune in. Now to a Supreme Court ruling that's having a major impact on Super Tuesday, specifically the state of Colorado. The Supreme Court unanimously rejected Colorado's effort to disqualify Trump from appearing on the state's primary election ballot. That decision reverses Colorado's Supreme Court ruling, which had determined that Trump could not serve as president again because he was part of an insurrection. The ruling is a major victory for Donald Trump, not only in Colorado, where voters are heading to the polls today, but two other states that had also moved to strike him from the ballot. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has more. The U.S. Supreme Court dealing a final blow to states trying to ban former President Trump from the ballot. In a unanimous decision, the justices effectively leaving it up to voters to decide if the former president returns to the White House. Mr. Trump praising the ruling. The voters can take the person out of the race very quickly, but a court shouldn't be doing that. The justice is rejecting a Colorado state court's ruling, finding Mr. Trump ineligible to be president under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, a largely untested clause of the Constitution passed after the Civil War, disqualifying those who engage in insurrection from holding public office again. An elections official in Maine and a judge in Illinois later doing the same, banning the Republican frontrunner from the ballot in those states in light of his actions on January 6. The ruling from the high court now ending all similar efforts to disqualify Mr. Trump from the ballot. While most uh, states were thrilled to have me, there were some that didn't, and they didn't want that for political reasons. The justice is saying that patchwork of different rulings across the country cannot stand, finding responsibility for enforcing Section 3 against federal office holders and candidates rests with Congress and not the states. But at the same time, the three liberal justices accusing their conservative colleagues of going too far by ruling Congress must enact new legislation in order to ban a presidential candidate writing this ruling will make it harder to bar an oath-breaking insurrectionist from becoming president. Conservative Justice Barrett cautioning this court should turn the national temperature down, not up. Our thanks to Laura Jarrett for that report. The decision was the court's most important ruling concerning a presidential election since 2000. That's when the court ruled in George W. Bush's favor in Bush versus Gore, which ruled that Florida violated the Equal Protection Clause by using different standards during the ballot recount. That decision ultimately gave Bush Florida's electoral votes and the presidency. Well, the U.S. Supreme Court is temporarily blocking a controversial immigration law that was set to take effect in Texas. The Biden administration sued to stop the law. It's known as SB4, which gives local police the power to arrest migrants who illegally cross the border from Mexico. Texas had argued the law was legal under the state war clause of the Constitution and also needed because the state's leadership believes it is effectively battling an invasion at the southern border. The Biden administration argues that a surge of unauthorized immigration is not the same as an invasion. The law was set to take effect on March 10th. However, the ruling puts it on hold until March 13th, giving all nine justices more time to determine what next steps to take. The latest round of ceasefire talks aimed at halting the war in Gaza and releasing Israeli hostages and Palestinian prisoners have ended without a breakthrough. The negotiations in Cairo involved Hamas and international mediators 
but no Israeli delegation attended. The U.S. and others are pushing to secure a deal before the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, which starts this weekend. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now. So, Matt, we understand the talks have, have broken up, no deal yet. What are the major sticking points? What happens next? <laughs> Yeah, guys, no deal. I think that everybody's probably disappointed, but probably not surprised, because this is certainly not the first false start that these negotiations have had. Ever since the last successful round of negotiations to release those hostages and release Palestinian prisoners and halt the fighting temporarily, ever since November, when we saw a week-long pause that saw a lot of those prisoners released. But, you know, a lot of the issues that you're asking about are the same ones that have persisted for the past several months of negotiations. The main one being, just now, Israel didn't attend that conference in Cairo. And the reason why is because Israel says that they need a demand answered from Hamas. That specific demand, which is actually sort of new, is saying they want a list of all of the hostages that are still alive. They want to know who they're negotiating for, whether or not the people they're negotiating for are alive or dead. And remember, there are more than 100 hostages who are currently being held in the Gaza Strip, including six Americans. So this is a big part of the negotiations. Uh, a lot of the hostages have been killed. We heard just a couple of weeks ago that as many as a fifth of those hostages have been killed. And it's not clear entirely why. Some, perhaps by Hamas, some succumb to the wounds that they sustain on October 7th during that terror attack that started off this latest round of fighting. Others were likely killed in Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip, the same force that has killed now more than 30,000 people, according to the Gaza Ministry of Health. So these are issues that are still persisting because both sides are so far apart. Hamas wants a permanent ceasefire and the release of all prisoners in Israeli prisons. That's something that the Israelis have said is a non-starter. In fact, Benjamin Netanyahu has said that those demands are ludicrous. So... Again, this is not going to be surprising, but disappointing that this is still not going anywhere. Guys. So, Matt, as we're well aware, as the images show, the conditions within the Gaza Strip are just deteriorating day by day. The UN's Agency for Palestinian Refugees, that's the agency at the forefront of relief work in Gaza amid this starvation that's now starting to happen there. There's some controversy here. The agency had its funding slashed by several countries, including the U.S., after Israel accused it of employing operatives from Hamas and other terror groups. The U.N. says it's waiting to receive evidence from Israel on the allegations, but yesterday we heard from UNRWA's chief about all this. What did he have to say? Yeah, well, he was basically complaining the same things that he's been saying for the past several months, that without this funding, particularly from the United States, which is the principal funder for UNRWA, that the Palestinian people will suffer. And even though this organization has announced that they are going to comply with the Israeli uh, investigation into their into Hamas's role uh, in their own organization, they at the same time have said, don't let the entire Palestinian people suffer because of this issue. Now here, as you mentioned, we heard from the head of your own Ra. Here's what he had to say. Without additional funding, we will be in uncharted territory with serious implications for global peace and security. The fate of the agency and the millions of people who depend on it hang in the balance. Excellencies, UNRWA is facing a deliberate and concerted campaign to undermine its operations and ultimately end them. So uh, all of this is counting down to Israel's assault on Rafah, which is the southernmost town a city in the Gaza Strip. Now, UNRWA and other aid agencies, other international community organizations have all warned that if this attack on UNRWA, which is where Israel says the final remnants of Hamas are living, that it could create what they are saying is a humanitarian catastrophe. And in that case, UNRWA and its funding will be needed more than ever. Guys. Uh, Matt, yesterday we reported on Vice President Kamala Harris's speech in Alabama. She criticized Israel over the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. Today, NBC News has some exclusive reporting about how administration officials actually watered down parts of that speech, which were especially critical of Israel. Real quick here, what can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because this was done by the National Security Council, which is, of course, part of the same administration. The fact is, is from our own reporting from my colleagues in Washington, they said that this wasn't a substantive shift that this was that was imposed upon Kamala Harris's speech. It was more a question of tone. There was no policy change. There was no uh, there was nothing that she was going to announce about American posture towards Israel that the National Security Council walked back. But still, it does go to show that Kamala Harris did have a more forceful tone in mind, a more forceful speech against Israel and that the U.S., which has been falling out with Benjamin Netanyahu for the past several months, decided to rein that in just a little bit. Now, whether or not the thinking is that it's best to just keep Israel on side, this is part of an evolving relationship between Washington and Israel and one that we're going to see continue to evolve probably in the coming months. Guys? Right. Matt Bradley, Matt, thank you. Let's get to your weather now. There is a soggy week in store for the East Coast. Let's check the forecast. Meteorologist Angie Lastman's here. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. We've got some rain in the forecast, and this is what we're going to be watching over the next couple of days across parts of the East, as you mentioned. Here's the deal right now. Your satellite and radar showing a couple spots where we see rain. We've got one moving into portions of the Northeast, places like Washington, D.C. to New York, a little soggy for this early morning commute. We've got some rain working across parts of the Midwest. You're going to see that slowly but surely work a little farther to the East as the day goes on. And down along the Gulf Coast and portions of the Southern Plains, we've got some more showers and thunderstorms that we're tracking through the day today. As we zoom in to parts of, of the Northeast, you can see, again, Washington, Philadelphia, New York, that area, the I-95 corridor, going to be a little wet this morning. You'll likely need a little additional time for that morning commute. Here's why. We've got a coastal low that's going to slide a little farther to the north. That's bringing the rain that you're seeing across that region this morning. As we look off towards those areas of the Midwest and parts of the South, we've got a cold front that is leaving us with that kind of unsettled weather as of right now. This is going to move to the east here as we go through the day today. The, the coastal low will be out of here, but look at this big push of moisture that we see as we get into the day tomorrow. This means heavy rain on the table for folks from North Carolina basically to Maine and the potential with some of these really impressive rainfall rates for us to see some flash flooding, especially as we get into the day tomorrow across portions of the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast. As we head into your Thursday, we're not done with the rain just yet. I think we could see a little bit of the snow, kind of maybe wintry mix mixing into that, uh, into areas of New England, but still it's going to be another day where it is unsettled. I mentioned tomorrow has the best chance for some of that flash flooding, including places like Boston, uh, Riverhead, Hartford, all included in that. New York, Philadelphia, also on the table to see some of that isolated flash flooding in those more urban areas. And here's why. As we get through Thursday, potential widespread amounts, anywhere an inch to two inches of rain expected. We could, though, be seeing uh, anywhere from uh, up to four inches of rain in a short period of time, guys. So the umbrella handy across this region is going to be good advice, not just today, but for the next couple of days. Mm. Uh, mine this morning. All right. Mm. This is where I get confused. It's like too cold for just a rain jacket, uh -huh. but then it's like what and another. And it's a mess. <laughs> it's a fashion nightmare. A All right. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. Much more to come here. Morning news now. There you go. <laughs> Later this hour on trial, the father of school shooter Ethan Crumbly now facing charges of his own. We're going to break down the case as jury selection gets underway. Up first, though, after the break, it's China's biggest political event of the year. But this year's two sessions, as it's called, comes with an unexpected expected twist will take you to Beijing where a surprise announcement is raising new questions. Stay with us. We will be right back. We are back with a surprise announcement out of China as officials gather for the country's biggest political event of the year. It's known as the two sessions where officials and political advisors of the ruling Chinese Communist Party gather for two annual meetings held simultaneously. Leaders use the week-long meetings in Beijing as an opportunity to signal their plans for the coming year. It's one of few opportunities for journalists to question top Chinese leaders, but for the first time in 30 years, officials say the country's premier will not talk with reporters at the close of the meetings. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey-Frayer joins us with more on this. Janice, good morning. So the Chinese government has declared this commitment to transparency, but then they're scrapping this opportunity for reporters to actually speak with Chinese officials. How are people reacting to the announcement and what does this tell us about President Xi Jinping? 
Well, there's a lot of surprise and a lot of questions around this move, which takes a famously opaque system and makes it even more of a black box because it's happening at a time when foreign policymakers, investors, businesses around the world are looking to China for some sort of signal on where the economy is heading here. The premier, Li Qiang, is the country's top economic official. So it's a missed opportunity uh, that he now doesn't want to talk about it. And it also ends a tradition here that accompanied the era of reform and opening up, as they called it. The news conference has happened for decades. Uh, it was one of the few opportunities where people were able to see this top-ranked official uh, publicly talking about the state's affairs. And it's also a missed opportunity for Li Qiang to build his public profile. But there is some speculation that that could be part of the reason. You know, I mean, Janice, China is struggling right now with high unemployment and other economic issues. So observers around the world were watching to see what actions the Chinese government is going to take to support the economy. Mm. What are they saying? They're not saying much on where the economy is heading. Li Chang set the growth targets for China's economy at 5%, which seems ambitious. Uh, and there were no real stimulus measures that accompanied that growth target. Uh, he did acknowledge that there are risks ahead, uh, that there are difficulties here in trying to create jobs, but there weren't any of the bold moves that the business sector was looking for uh, to answer how it is that China is going to deal with a property crisis, uh, a slump in consumer spending, there's deflation, declining stocks, all of these things that are troubling the economy, which of course matters to the U.S. and economies around the world because of the size of, of China's economy. Janice, heading into this year's meeting, there's been a lot of speculation about China's next foreign minister. The current foreign minister is widely considered an interim minister. What can we expect uh, in terms of an announcement, do you think we'll get that anytime soon? Well, there was a lot of speculation heading into this NPC that there might be uh, some announcement or unveiling of a new foreign minister. Chin Gong, you'll remember, was abruptly fired last year, and it really kicked off a lot of rumors uh, because he was widely considered part of Xi Jinping's inner circle. Uh, for now, Wang Yi is holding the position again, uh, and he's doing so in addition to his job as the country's top diplomat. And from all of the signals or comments uh, that came out of the proceedings yesterday, it doesn't seem like they're going to be announcing a foreign minister after this session or any time in the near future. The front runner is still considered to be uh, a man called Liu Jian Chao. He started as a translator back in 1987 and has worked his way up through the ranks. And he's already doing a lot of the diplomatic footwork, but he hasn't quite been anointed yet. Uh, uh, Wang Yi will be conducting the foreign minister's news conference for these political meetings before the end of the week. Guys. All right, Janice, thank you so much. Haiti is under a state of emergency this morning after a mass jailbreak. Over the weekend, armed gang members stormed the country's largest jails and freed thousands of prisoners. Now they're trying to seize control of Haiti's largest international airport. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber has more. Haiti spiraling toward anarchy. A 72-hour state of emergency declared after armed gangs stormed two of the nation's largest prisons on Saturday and Sunday, according to the government. Close to 4,000 prisoners reportedly escaped during the violent assault. The exact death toll is unknown. But bodies were seen lining the streets of Port-au-Prince as police unions publicly pleaded for backup. The Associated Press reporting heavily armed gangs tried to take control of the country's largest international airport, exchanging gunfire with soldiers as employees fled. The government says gangs that now control an estimated 80 percent of the nation's capital city following the 2021 assassination of President Jovenel Moïse are behind the bloody prison break. One of their targets, Haiti's National Penitentiary, houses several high-profile inmates, including Colombian nationals accused of being involved in the plot to kill President Moïse. 
Prolific gang leaders like Jimmy Cherizier, who's known as Barbecue, have been calling for the arrest of Haiti's acting president, Prime Minister Ariel Henry, for months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barbecue doubled down following the prison attacks, releasing a public message telling Haitians the gangs, quote, seek to liberate the country. Henri was out of the country at the time of the prison break, working with leaders in Kenya to finalize an agreement that would fast track the deployment of police officers for a UN approved mission aimed at regaining control of the nation. <laughs> Violence in Haiti is not new, but it is steadily escalating. Last year, the number of people killed in armed gang conflicts was two times higher than the year before. Haiti is trapped, trapped with a government that doesn't govern, incapable of doing anything. It looks now like the gangs, which are the only ones that can establish any kind of political order in Haiti, are coming together. For the residents of Port-au-Prince, help can't come soon enough. Our thanks to Ellis and Barber for that report. The State Department is closely monitoring the situation and it's urging U.S. citizens inside of Haiti to leave as soon as possible. Coming up, jury selection set for today in the trial of the father of convicted school shooter Ethan Crumbly. When we come back, the charges he faces in a case that could set a new precedent in America. Plus, feeling overworked? You're not alone. We're going to break down the symptoms of something called misalignment burnout and what you can do to fight it. You're watching Morning News now. Welcome back. Jury selection begins today in the trial for the father of teenage school shooter Ethan Crumbly. Last month, a Michigan jury found his mother guilty of involuntary manslaughter after her son killed four classmates in a school shooting. Prosecutors accuse James Crumbly of failure to properly store his firearm and failure to provide reasonable care for his son. He's charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter. Lawyers say that negligence allowed his son access to the gun, which was used to kill four classmates and wound seven others. Crumbly has pleaded not guilty. Now, his mother, Jennifer, is currently awaiting sentencing, faces up to 15 years in prison, while Ethan is serving a life sentence. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos is here with more on what to expect from this trial. Danny, good morning. So walk us through jury selection. What kind of questions do you think these prospective jurors are going to be asked as they try and bring this group together? This is a very suburban county in Michigan. It's got a lot of people, but there's no main city in this county. And the other thing to know about Michiganders, of which I am one, is that they are a lot of gun owners, a lot of hunters. So these are all folks who are going to be familiar mostly with guns themselves, or they're going to have a close family relative who has a firearm in the home. Now, it may be a shotgun, it may be a blunderbuss, it may be a pistol. It's hard to say, but in a community that has a lot of hunters, you're going to have a lot of people who own guns. And you do not, in my view, want gun owners on this jury mm. if you're the defense. That may sound counterintuitive, but I find in working with experts that there is no harsher critic of other gun owners than lawful gun owners. Mm. Um, so as we've mentioned here, Jennifer Crumbly uh, faced a similar trial. She was found guilty on all four counts just weeks ago. James now is facing the exact same charges, and the facts really seem similar, except for kind of this added allegation that James bought the gun, was responsible for storing the gun. Uh, what are you kind of taking away from what we just saw with Jennifer Crumbly? How will these cases compare? Well, we learned some fascinating things that everyone's known for a long time in the legal community after the first Crumbly trial ended and the juror, one of the, the four persons, uh, made the rounds on media. You learn that, hey, anything you think the jury's focusing on, they may be focusing on something totally different. And mom's jury focused on the fact that she was the last one with access to the gun, which in my view was a relatively legally insignificant factor, but you never know what a jury's going to focus on. So maybe you take from that for the father's case that you focus on blaming the mom, focus on still blaming school officials, and really focus on blaming your son. And maybe you'll see them do that more stridently here. They did that a softer version of that with the mother's trial. You may see them come out uh, really focusing on blaming others, third parties, uh, for this shooting, of which there are several. You have school officials, you have mom, and of course you have the shooter himself. Are there strategies, Danny, that the defense can use for James that maybe weren't even an option for Jennifer? Mm. Yes. For example, 
Uh, James uh, might focus on the fact that mom was the last person with access to this firearm, even if James did purchase the firearm. He may focus on mom took him to the shooting range. Mom was more involved. I expected a little of that with, um, with the mother's trial. I expected them to point the fingers at each other more, especially given the fact they haven't apparently even spoken to each other since just shortly after the shooting. So uh, I expect uh, James Crumbly to, to try pointing the finger more at the mother in this case uh, than the mother pointed it at James, the father, in her case. The other thing, too, you might see a totally different witness testify. I don't think uh, Ethan's mother testified all that well in her defense. It's understandable. Testifying is scary, and most folks are not naturals at it. Uh, if James is a better speaker, uh, if, he, if he enunciates better, if he's a better talker, you might see him take the stand and do better than his wife mm. did just a few weeks ago. Mm. All right, we'll see what happens. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Now to an NBC News investigation exploring the fentanyl fight at the southern border. Authorities there have been given new advanced scanners to help detect the drug being smuggled inside vehicles. But we've learned millions of dollars worth of these scanners are not being used. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley takes a closer look. We're on the front lines of the fentanyl crisis, Nogales, Arizona. Half of all fentanyl seized coming in from Mexico is stopped here. But critics say the Biden administration is not doing enough. With fentanyl overdoses now the leading cause of death for Americans aged 18 to 45. Acting CBP Commissioner Troy Miller tells us virtually all fentanyl is brought across in vehicles. It's driven by men, women, young, old, U.S. citizens, Mexican citizens. And he tells us border agents have begun using a new technology to identify fentanyl hidden in vehicles. We watch as officers first question drivers and inspect cars. Then they may be referred for a scan. This is new technology that's been installed to x-ray cars that officers suspect might be carrying narcotics. It's been installed here in Nogales because it's considered the ground zero for fentanyl trafficking. But less than 5% of personal vehicles and 20% of commercial vehicles coming into the U.S. are actually scanned. With more new technology, Miller wants to bring those numbers up to 40% of cars and 70% of commercial trucks, but not for another two years. Why not scan every vehicle through an x-ray? We see a million people crossing our border uh, every single day. If we tried to scan every single shipment and person coming into this country, we would shut down legitimate trade and travel. We We've learned millions of dollars of taxpayer purchased fentanyl scanners are sitting in warehouses unused. We need approximately $300 million for civil works to actually put the technology in the ground. And it's money you've already spent, but it's sitting there. Is that frustrating for you? Very frustrating. It's extremely frustrating. But in Tucson, Teresa Guerrero is demanding authorities do much more. Every year, enough fentanyl is trafficked into the U.S. to kill every American. I think the border needs to be closed, to be honest with you, because we're a super highway um, and they're just pouring in. This is, I believe, our last picture together. Guerrero lost her son Jacob four years ago when cocaine he ingested was secretly laced with fentanyl. She says Jacob was athletic, a free spirit, and always ready to help his friends. If only, if only you always ask those questions, but I don't want another parent to have to say, if only. Our thanks to Julia Ainsley for that report. CBP Commissioner Miller is also calling on Congress for more money so they can start putting more scanners to use. Time now for our weekly mental health check in. We're going to take a look at the mental health impact of having a job that might not be the right fit for you. Plus, a new study shows just how much our pets can boost our health. Joining us now to help break it down is psychotherapist Dr. Robbie Ludwig. Dr. Robbie, always great to have you with us. Thanks for being here. So we talked in the segment a lot before about the big problem of burnout caused by working too yes. much, what that can do for you. But I understand that there's a psychologist out there who thinks many of us might also be experiencing what's called misalignment burnout. What does that mean and how can we work to fix it? So misalignment burnout is exactly how it sounds. It's when your job is not in sync with who you are, what your value systems are, what you want to do in the world. And it can feel soul crushing when there's a mismatch because work is where we spend a lot of our time. All right. Let's, and how can yeah. we fix that? 
So the way to fix it is really to ask yourself, what gives you joy? What would you like to do? Get some support for yourself. And there are ways because we pay our bills with our jobs. So there are certainly ways to incorporate what you love, either through volunteering or a hobby, just to incorporate um, feeling purposeful and feeling that you're in sync with what you're meant to do. Mm. Good advice there mm -hmm. on the screen. All right, let's talk about how mental health is portrayed on the big screens. You got some classic movies like Fatal Attraction oh. and Psycho. They're often criticized for how they do <laughs> that. But now a new wave of psychologists, they're actually trying to improve the way mental health is portrayed in movies. So what do you think we're getting wrong about mental health on the screen? What should we be seeing? Mm. I always like to say when therapists or psychiatrists are misrepresented in the media, it's some writer who's very angry with their own therapist. But we're seeing a new trend where psychologists are being hired to represent therapy and help in a more accurate way. And it's shifting the way culture really sees therapy and mental health and seeking treatment. It's destigmatizing what treatment is all about. So in many ways, it's a very good thing that we're seeing this shift. In, and the movies really are a mirror and a window into the possibilities of who we are and what's available to us. Hmm. All right, last but certainly not least, a new survey shows 84% of Americans with pets say the animals give them a mental health boost. This is also an opportunity for me to show off my dog Lucy, full disclosure, but Aww, Dr. Robbie. Oh, so cute. Doctor, she, she, we'll see her in just a second. <laughs> <laughs> there there she is. Oh, There's There's Lucy. Dog. Look at that. Such, and she is a mental health boost for sure. I mean, don't get me wrong, it, she's also a, a stress inducer, but how do pets make such a difference to people? The studies are really consistent. So pets offer unconditional love, companionship. They also can reduce anxiety and depression and also reduce loneliness, which is a big epidemic in this country. So uh, the studies are really true and support pets and dogs are man best man best friend and um, you know they're adorable to have around as well. So it's a win-win situation. <laughs> So true. I know. Whenever my husband's out of town, I feel like I am the crazy person who's like talking with the dog. I'm like, oh, what's up, Liz? Because <laughs> we're all alone, but it's nice to have her. All right, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, thanks so much. Good to see you. Have Coming a great up, day. we are getting into vacay mode. After the break, we're going to explore why more people are choosing to do, well, nothing while on vacation. Pack your bags. Morning News Now will be right back. We are back now with some financial headlines for you. New rules are coming to cap credit card late fees. CNBC's Savannah Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Joe, Savannah, good morning to you. All right, let's start with that. So the Biden administration announcing new measures today to fight high prices and those so-called junk fees. Now, among the new rules, capping most credit card late fees at $8 or requiring banks to show why they should charge more. The average late fee is now $32. The government estimates banks brought in roughly $14 billion in fees last year. President Biden is also forming a new strike force to crack down on unfair pricing on groceries, prescription drugs, and health care. Whole Foods plans to open smaller format quick shop stores. The Whole Foods Daily Shop will be about a quarter to half the size of a regular store. And the aim is to allow for more locations in dense metro areas. Customers will still have access to grab and go meals and snacks, recipe ingredients and grocery essentials. The first store will open on the Upper East Side of New York City later this year with plans to expand to other U.S. cities. And you can now edit your DMs on Instagram. Meta has rolled out an update allowing users to change their minds if they make a mistake. But you only have 15 minutes to do so. And you can make the edits by pressing and holding on the message on the sent message, which then creates a drop down menu. You look for edit and make the required changes. Other updates to DMs include being able to pin up to three of your favorite messages at the top of the feed, which could be useful for ongoing chats, guys. Mm. All right, Silvana, thank you so much. Yeah. Spring break is just around the corner. Many are looking to get away for some time in the sun, mm -hmm. but experts say Generation Z is changing the travel landscape for 2024. Yeah, say goodbye to a bunch of excursions or scheduled dinners and food tours. 
sabbaticals and do nothing vacations. That's apparently where it's at. Yeah, <laughs> for more on this trend, let's bring in travel expert Mark Hellwood to break it down for us. So let's start with sabbaticals because yeah. I was reading about this yeah. yesterday. Sounds great to me. One study found nearly 7% of salaried workers were on sabbatical in January of this year, twice That's as high high. as 2019. Well, numbers okay. numbers right. even right. higher for Gen Z. Explain to us, what does this look like? What's behind this trend? So what this looks like is basically six months of paid time off. So in other words, a big chunk. You're already envisioning this, yeah. right? I'm looking at you both yeah. staring at me thinking, yeah, right. I, essentially, I think what is driving this is a shift in the work landscape. There was a period when a company offered you great perks, a foosball table, uh, free lunch. <laughs> and then we had a period when we could work from home. And there's a, there's a real shift to pushing us back into the office. Hey. So you want to throw a perk at someone and you say, look, work here for five years, you can have six months on us. And I think that's what's driving mm. that. I mean, do you think with the hybrid aspect, people are still finding ways to kind of like work remote <laughs> for a long time? Absolutely. Which totally, you know, yeah, it, yeah, totally. potentially could. But anyway, all right, that's not the only trend changing mm -hmm. apparently this year. So let's talk about this concept of a do nothing vacation. I <laughs> mean, what is that? Vacation, so, I like to call it. I think a do nothing <laughs> vacation is what we used to do in school. It's called right. vacation. And it is an interesting, it's a, an interesting shift because it's telling us, wow, when I want time off, I actually want time off. Mm. I was at a private island, mm. Como Lothala in Fiji last week, and it, oh. these, I mean, good. <laughs> these, but these, these private islands, the whole point of them is you go there and you're not going sightseeing. There's, there's one in French Polynesia, there's, one, there's many in the Caribbean. You go there to have someone bring you a drink to say, maybe I'll do a game of tennis if I feel like it, or I'll just have a nap. And I think it's because our lives are so busy, we say, oh, I just want time off. An actual recharge. Mm -hmm. like yeah. actually Wait, give me this again. You were on this private island last week. I like how you suddenly yeah. dropped that. Yeah. I was in Fiji. Excuse me. Yeah. But, it's, but it is, it's, this new, it's this new drive to, I, I call them exclusive all-inclusives. You'll see places like Hyatt and Marriott. They're bringing yeah. in a new kind of all-inclusive, which isn't that gross thing where you're basically like, can I eat my body weight in French fries in three days? It's about saying, I don't want that pain of paying. I don't want a check at the end of the experience. I want to pay up front and just have fun. Real quickly, <laughs> how do you plan a do-nothing vacation? You, you look for an all-inclusive. Remember, if you see all-inclusive, it's no longer a big blaring warning sign, okay. you know, steer clear. Look for those high-end all-inclusives, places like Hyatt Marriott's opening a Ritz-Carlton one. That is how you plan it. And you won't have to do anything but say, one more drink, please. Some of them are yeah. still... Sure, again. <laughs> I went to one recently. <laughs> okay, I think that's, uh, that's a totally other story. Yeah, yeah. Mark, so... Do, do a little research. Yeah. <laughs> right. Mark up to me. Thank you so much. Thank Let's you. Work. Coming up, it's like a scene out of a Western gone out of control. After the break, we're going to take you to Utah, where tumbleweeds have totally taken over. Really? It's morning news now. He may have made his name outside the ring, but now he will join wrestling's all-time greats. Longtime professional wrestling icon Paul Heyman is the first inductee revealed for this year's WWE Hall of Fame class. Now, he's not a wrestler. Known as the wise man, he's played many roles in the industry, starting as a photographer in the 70s, a commentator for WWE, and as a manager for some of wrestling's biggest stars like Brock Lesnar. But one of the biggest ways he put his imprint on the industry, well, after he was fired from World Championship Wrestling, he launched something called Extreme Championship Wrestling, or ECW, which was really, really extreme and influenced <laughs> its competitors. These days, he's in WWE and known as the special counsel for the Universal Champ, Roman Reigns. The WWE Hall of Fame ceremony will be held in Philadelphia on April 5th. He's really well known, and he's like one of those people whose skill is on the microphone, if you will. It's so funny when we talk about this and you know everything and I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Got about a different language. It shows that this is my area of expertise. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> I don't know anything about travel or, you know, but, <laughs> but this I got. Oh my gosh, I love it. All right, let's now head to Salt Lake City where residents in one town there were left dealing with a tumbleweed takeover. Strong winds brought the dead foliage rolling into town, piling up next to homes, cars, and covering streets. One of my old colleagues, reporter Alex Cabrero from our affiliate KSL in Salt Lake City has the story. Of all the things to see in South Jordan, John Young, I don't know, never thought his home would become the latest attraction. You take pictures, you take videos, and you hope the wind changes. It 
it's not every day you see thousands of tumbleweeds rolling for a visit. I, I opened up the blinds and this was on my front porch. There's even a car in there somewhere. What do you do? You just laugh. There's nothing to do but laugh. As heavy winds blew through this daybreak neighborhood in South Jordan, avoiding tumbleweeds kind of became a sport. And the more you tried to get rid of them, the more that seemed to just come right back. Yeah, oh yeah, it, it, it twirls. Stan Romero had quite the surprise when he opened his garage door. And boom, it was 10 foot high, you know, coming in the garage. Oh, close that door. <laughs> South Jordan street workers showed up with a dumpster and backhoe to clear roads and pathways. Luckily, it's something we can handle. This is not our first tumble, Mageddon. <laughs> it's true. Daybreak has been through a tumbleweed invasion before. You tend to get that as you develop into open land, but this is about as western as it gets. We've had a few tumbleweeds, but nothing like this. It's absolutely crazy. It is absolutely crazy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Thanks to Alex Cabrera from our affiliate KSL in Salt Lake City again for that report. Well, if that wasn't enough, a storm also brought snow to the region <laughs> over the weekend. Just all I kinds of things. I don't feel like. as bad, though, about any dust bunnies that have accumulated yeah. <laughs> in the corner of, of my place. Yeah. <laughs> so that's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Good morning. Happy Super Tuesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, it is make or break time for Nikki Haley, the Republican challenger preparing for what could be her last stand on this Super Tuesday. Fifteen states are in play today. Former President Trump remains in prime position to seal the Republican nomination. His campaign getting a major boost from the Supreme Court, striking down a move by Colorado to remove him from the primary ballot. We're building up to what could be a pivotal day in the race for the White House. Also this morning, hopes of securing a ceasefire deal in Gaza hanging in the balance after talks end without a breakthrough. We have the latest on that as the World Health Organization warns that children in northern Gaza are dying from starvation. Here in the U.S., the first over-the-counter birth control pills are set to hit the shelves soon. What you need to know about the newly approved contraceptive. Plus, hanging up the helmet, Jason Kelsey retiring after 13 years in the NFL. We'll take a look at his storied career, his emotional farewell, and why the Eagle Star Center is calling it quits. Does have a brother that's fairly well known. Yeah, in exactly. The NFL right I do now. feel though like you can't watch this speech he gave without tearing up. It's it pretty is. amazing. It's good. We're going to bring you that in a little bit. Let's begin this hour, of course, with Super Tuesday, the biggest single voting day in the primary season. And today is a potential make or break day for former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley in her Republican primary fight against former President Donald Trump. She is looking to gain momentum after winning her first primary this past weekend in Washington, D.C. Mr. Trump is looking to move closer to winning the Republican nomination with a big night tonight. Now, there are nearly 900 GOP delegates up for grabs today. That is more than one-third of the total number of delegates. Voters will cast their ballots in more than a dozen states. We have full coverage ahead this morning. We've got NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki at the big board and NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. But let's get started this hour with NBC's Garrett Haig. He is outside of former President Trump's floor. Overnight, home. Donald Trump notched another victory in the North Dakota caucuses, but his biggest win yesterday came from the Supreme Court, which said he could stay on the ballot across the country. Today, he's hoping it's voters that give him a big victory victory on what could be the decisive day of the Republican primary. This morning, the road to the White House stretching from coast to coast as Republican voters in 15 states from Alaska to Alabama cast their primary ballots. <laughs> GOP frontrunner Donald Trump, who swept the first seven states of the primary, is widely expected to pick up the lion's share of the more than 800 delegates at stake today. Haley, she's not a problem. Uh, I think she's very negative for the party, but she's not a problem in terms of winning because we're winning by a lot. It's great to be here in Fort Worth. While Nikki Haley, fresh off her first victory of the campaign over the weekend in Washington, D.C., taking aim at Trump in Texas, arguing since his first term, he's been a drag on the party as a whole with losses at the state and federal levels. At some point, maybe we should say the reason that America keeps losing is because of Donald Trump. 
Today's Super Tuesday contests come on the heels of a unanimous Supreme Court ruling Monday in Mr. Trump's favor, ordering his name be included on primary ballots in Colorado and other states where courts or officials had tried to bar him for allegedly engaging in insurrection on January 6th. You cannot take somebody out of a race because an opponent would like to have it that way. Mr. Trump praising the ruling and arguing he's been politically targeted by the Biden Department of Justice. It's the nonsense cases and everybody sees it. The Biden campaign responding, calling Mr. Trump's statement, quote, unhinged, confused ramblings focused only on himself. But the focus tonight will be on Trump, who's throwing a party here in Florida, and on Nikki Haley, who's heading back to South Carolina with no events scheduled, adding to the speculation that the end of her campaign might be near. All right, Garrett, thank you. For more on Super Tuesday, we're joined by NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki at the big board and NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. Good morning to both of you. John, let's start with you. What are you watching for tonight as the results start to come in? Any indicator that might tell us how the night's going to go? I'm, I'm watching to see if there is some major uh, national natural disaster. I don't know if it's a tumbleweed Mageddon <laughs> or uh, the sun uh, suddenly uh, falling out of the sky. Uh, basically, Donald Trump is uh, expected to and, and barring some sort of uh, major natural national disaster uh, going to clean up uh, tonight. And he, he's uh, I think Steve may talk about this, but it's unlikely that he'll actually clinch the nomination tonight, but I, you know, uh, from a practical matter, it is expected to. John, also, uh, as we heard in Garrett's piece, their big news yesterday, the Supreme Court ruled that Trump is able to be on the primary ballot in Colorado and other states that were challenging his eligibility, citing the 14th Amendment because of the events leading up to the January 6th attack at the Capitol. Tell us just major takeaways from this decision. Well, I mean, number one, I think that this effort is dead um, in terms of not just Colorado, but obviously uh, other states that want to do similar things to try to take Trump off the ballot. The Supreme Court was pretty clear on this, nine to nothing. Um, uh, you know, that states can't take uh, this, can't take a federal candidate off the ballot. Uh, I also think that you're seeing the number of uh, pathways uh, that uh, that could have prevented Donald Trump, you know, from the legal system, or made it that much harder for him from the legal system to run for president or to win the presidency. Those are starting to close off. I do think that there is one really fascinating sort of thing that was embedded uh, in uh, one of the concurring opinions written by the three liberal justices. So they agreed uh, that Colorado shouldn't be able to take Trump off the ballot. Uh, but in their agreement, they said. Uh, they were called, repeatedly referred to oath-breaking insurrectionists, which I think is an indication of where they might be inclined to go uh, in terms of uh, challenges to him uh, in the future based on trying to overturn the 2020 election. Steve, let's bring you in here. I'm guessing tumbleweeds may not be on the big board, but give us the lay of the land as we head into tonight. Yeah, I mean, look, John got to the bottom line there just in terms of the expectations going in. Take a look what's uh, what's uh, uh, on deck right now today. In yellow, you see the states that are going to be voting today. What you see here, this is the current delegate count heading into tonight, the magic number on the Republican side being 1,215. And I think a couple things to highlight here. The number one is the biggest delegate prize on the board tonight for the Republicans. It is California, 169 delegates. And, and you see the rule in California, no independents, no Democrats can vote. It is a closed Republican primary. And we've seen Nikki Haley's strength, the backbone of it really has been independents and even Democrats where they've been allowed to vote. None of that in California. And California, a winner-take-all state. If Donald Trump can just get 50% plus one, he gets all 169. Texas, the next biggest prize on the board today, 161 delegates. It's not quite as cut and dry as California, but you've got a very conservative, Trump-friendly electorate. They give out winner-take-all delegates by congressional district. Every reason to suspect Trump is going to get the overwhelming share of those 161. So you can see just between those two states how quickly that number is poised to rise for Trump. Uh, other states here quickly to note, Alabama, Arkansas, Oklahoma in particular, these could be states where Trump essentially gets all the delegates just based on the strength he has with the types of voters who predominate in those states. So again, it's just even if Haley is getting 40 percent 
43% in a lot of these states. That's her best number so far, 43 in New Hampshire. Even if she's getting 43 in a bunch of these states, the way the rules are now on this day for the Republicans, the rules are designed to get a quick and decisive outcome to this nominating race. So 40, 43% is not going to translate into many delegates. So Steve, walk us through any places among the 15 states where Republicans are voting today where Nikki Haley could make some headway. So there, there are a few, actually. Uh, the most uh, obvious, I would say, is right here, Vermont. Uh, Vermont is an open primary, no party registrations, very small state. Remember, Haley did get 43 percent next door in New Hampshire. Vermont was one of Donald Trump's worst states in the 2016 primaries. The first time he ran, he only got 32 percent of the vote back then. John Kasich, Marco Rubio, who were running against him, had a lot of demographic overlap with what Haley's getting now. They combined for an outright majority of the vote in Vermont in 2016. She could absolutely, I think, take a uh, take a run at Trump in Vermont. Virginia is interesting, especially in the northern part of Virginia. Uh, key to Virginia, they do give out delegates based on congressional district. And you mentioned the Washington, D.C. primary. Very low turnout, but demographically, the Washington, D.C. Republican electorate has a lot of overlap with the northern Virginia, the right in the D.C. suburbs, a couple of congressional districts there. So Haley could make some noise around there, pick up a few delegates. Um, you know, Minnesota, Colorado, she could do reasonably well in these states. But again, Vermont's only 17 delegates. We're talking about district delegates in Virginia. We're talking about just a share in Colorado, Minnesota, even if she's doing that. It's going to be swamped very quickly by all of these other Trump areas I was just showing you. Steve, let's look ahead to the general election. If we have a Biden-Trump rematch, what are things looking like? So here it is. I mean, this is just in the last several days, four major national polls coming out on a Biden-Trump rematch with Trump ahead by anywhere between two and four points in all four. Our own NBC poll from a few weeks ago had Trump ahead by five. The obvious significance there is how different this looks from the last go-round in 2020. There was not a single, not one major poll in 2020 that had Biden losing to Donald Trump. We got four here just in the last couple of days. What is behind this? One stat that stands out is from this New York Times poll that came out a couple of days ago. They basically asked of Trump's voters in 2020, how many are still with him now. They found 97% in their poll. How many of Biden's 2020 voters say in the New York Times poll they are still with Biden? 85%. Look at that difference there, a double-digit difference. That's the slack for Biden. That's the difference between Biden leading every poll in 2020 and slightly trailing in many now. Steve and John getting us ready for a big mm -hmm. Super Tuesday. Thank you both. You got it. Stay with NBC News now for coverage of Super Tuesday all day long. Our extensive live coverage gets underway tonight, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 o'clock. Well, this morning, talks aimed at bringing a ceasefire to Gaza and releasing Israeli hostages and Palestinian prisoners have stalled. The latest session of negotiations in Cairo ended without a breakthrough, with a deadline to reach a deal by the start of Ramadan now hanging in the balance. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us from Tel Aviv. Hi, Raf. Good morning. Savannah, good morning. Yeah, no sign of a breakthrough at those talks in Cairo. Both Israel and Hamas saying effectively the ball is in the other side's court. And it is looking now increasingly unlikely that a deal will be in place by the start of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, which begins on Sunday. This morning, time is running out to get a ceasefire deal before the start of Ramadan. We're in a window of time right now where we can actually get a hostage deal done. The U.S. putting new and urgent pressure on both Israel and Hamas. We need to get more aid in. We need to get the hostages out. As fears for those hostages grow following a chilling new U.N. report that found clear and convincing proof that some had been raped while in captivity. Uh, we saw a catalog of the most extreme and inhumane forms of torture and other horrors. <laughs> The U.N. says there's also evidence Hamas fighters committed rape during the October 7th attack at at least three locations, including the Supernova Music Festival. Hamas denying the U.N.'s findings, calling them false accusations. Under a proposed deal for a six-week ceasefire, Hamas would release around 40 hostages, many of them women, in exchange for around 400 Palestinian prisoners. The deal would also bring more aid into Gaza, where famine is tightening its grip. 
The U.S. planning additional aid drops from military aircraft, but humanitarian groups say it's nowhere near enough to fend off starvation. This view from a Jordanian aid plane shows the staggering devastation in Gaza City after five months of Israeli bombing. Somewhere down below, Samia al Masri is praying for a ceasefire as she feeds her children with pancakes made out of barley meant for animals. Sometimes I add a bit of sugar, she says. A mom doing what little she can to spare her children the bitterness of war. Now, in just the last hour, the U.S. military has carried out a second aid drop over Gaza. We're told by Central Command three U.S. aircraft were involved. They dropped around 36,000 meals into Gaza. But as you heard in the piece, humanitarian groups are saying you cannot fend off starvation with airdrops. What needs to happen is much more aid coming in by land. Two Israeli officials tell NBC this morning the Israeli military is drawing up plans for a new aid crossing directly into northern Gaza. That crossing likely to be in the area around Kibbutz Beri, one of the kibbutzim that was attacked on October 7th. But they say at this point no plans have been finalized. Guys. All right, Raf, thank you so much. Last month, the mother of convicted school shooter Ethan Crumbly was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, marking the first time in U.S. history that a parent was held criminally responsible for a shooting carried out by their child. Now his father is set to have his day in court with jury selection in his trial on the same charges set to begin today. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us now with what we can expect. Steph, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning to you guys. This will be another closely watched trial as jurors weigh how much they should hold a father responsible for for a crime his son committed. This morning, a month after that guilty verdict gripped the country. We find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter. James Crumbly starts trial with jury selection for his role in a mass school shooting carried out by his son, Ethan. His wife, Jennifer, was the first parent in the U.S. held criminally responsible for a school shooting carried out by their child. Both charged with four counts, one count for each student killed. Prosecutors say Ethan used a semi-automatic handgun allegedly bought by his dad as a gift days before the shooting. They also argued Jennifer was negligent and ignored the warnings. Crumbly's parents were called to his high school the morning of the shooting over concerns about a drawing he made of a gun and a message, the thoughts won't stop, help me. She did not give him the help that he wanted. But Jennifer Crumbly's defense team said her husband, James, was responsible for the storage and safety of the gun. I just didn't feel comfortable being in charge of that. It was more his thing, so I let him handle that. I didn't feel comfortable putting the lock thing on it. Experts say James's attorneys likely watched Jennifer's trial closely to adjust their strategy. The jury foreperson telling Savannah on today that Jennifer's testimony and evidence was pivotal for jurors. Jennifer didn't separate her son from the gun enough to save those lives that day. Craig Schilling's son, Justin, was among the four killed. He's always on my heart. He helps her have to have to stay high. You know what I mean? You're, you're in it. You want the accountability. You want the you want the right verdict. That jury selection begins this morning in the same courtroom with the same judge as his wife's trial. James Crumbly pleaded not guilty to the charges, guys. All right. Stephanie, thank you so much. You're welcome, Kim. Well, this morning, residents are still digging out after a multi-day blizzard in California's Sierra Nevada mountains. What's worse is after a weekend of heavy snowfall and gusty winds, another big storm is headed their way. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson joins us now from Truckee, California with more. Steve, good morning. And Savannah, this current system, nowhere near as dangerous as the snow that we got over the weekend. But with 10-foot snow piles still on the ground in people's communities, any small amount of snow on top of that can lead to a big headache. This morning, the race is on to dig out vehicles and homes from a weekend blizzard before snow from a new storm starts piling up again. We had grass coming up in our yard on Thursday, and now our windows are all buried on our house, so... This is the aftermath of an intense multi-day storm that unleashed a life-threatening assault on the mountain west, dumping five to ten feet of snow across the region. It was full on. Like, it was definitely some pretty intense periods of whiteout conditions. The region 
nation's major thoroughfare, Interstate 80, finally reopening after disrupting traffic and commerce for days. It has been a real mess. If you live in it, then you're used to it. But if you're not, I would just say don't come up here if you don't have to. Because of heavy snow and winds that reached 190 miles per hour at the highest peaks, officials and locals still urging caution on the roads. We've just been taking it slow, you know, going 25, 30 miles an hour. The storm effectively ending the season's snow drought, bringing California's snowpack level up to 104% of normal, up from just 32% at the start of this calendar year. Lake Tahoe's famous ski resorts opening back up carefully, with conditions still sketchy up top and deep powder everywhere. Today we're going to go ski some mellow tree lines and hopefully avoid the avalanches. And with this current system now pushing south, anybody coming to enjoy the snow now is getting a warning from officials about avalanche danger. You mm. don't want to be here in the backcountry if you don't know what you're doing right now. Savannah. Oof, that is so true. Steve, thank you so much. All right, as we mentioned, another storm set to bring more snow to the northern Sierras today. Let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather. Angie Lastman is here with the details. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. And some important notes that differ uh, from the previous storm that we saw to the one that we're going to see here that we're gearing up for over the next day or so. Not quite as impactful, and especially the location of where we'll pick up additional rain and snow. It's focused towards the northern Sierra, and it is not going to add additional snow to folks in places like like Tahoe. So that's a good a good uh, tidbit for folks that have really been hit with some really heavy snow over the past couple of days. In the meantime, here's what it looks like right now. You can see Northern California getting uh, some of this rain along the coast and stretching up into points north of that. We do see some additional snowfall again in parts of the Northern Sierra. That is where we have those uh, winter alerts that are up right now. You can see in the bright pink, the winter storm warnings. We also have those winter weather advisories in effect and they extend out towards the Rockies. We will see additional snowfall for folks in the Rockies through the day today. Here's the culprit. This system that's going to work on shore. Again, the snow is and the rain, for that uh, for that matter, are, are focused across portions of northern California. It does stretch into the Rockies, so we'll pick up some of that snow there where those alerts are in effect. Places like Yellowstone, out to Boise, out to Medford. We'll see a bit of a wintry mix for folks there. And then as we get into the day tomorrow, notice that this system brings all of this rain from basically the Bay Area all the way down into San Diego. We will see some showers likely as that low pressure gets a little closer to the coast. This is going to leave it unsettled for folks up and down the coast of California and in inland areas too. When it's all said and done here, as we get through at least the midweek, you could see maybe a quarter of an inch to a half of an inch across uh, areas of this region. Specifically, San Luis Obispo down towards San Diego. I think the higher amounts are going to be focused up towards Northern California where they'll have more prolonged rain. When it comes to the snowfall forecast, picking up an additional six to 12 feet or 12 inches rather is, is possible, maybe up to a foot or higher in some of those spots. But it's looking like uh, that, that's going to be the general amount that we'll see. And again, not looking for additional snowfall around Lake Tahoe, really important as they continue to dig out. Meanwhile, a different story across the country when it comes to Temperatures. We've got uh, places like Chicago, St. Louis, Wichita, all running well above average for this time of year. Omaha is set to hit 57 degrees today, running more than 10 degrees above average uh, across this region. And we've got 70s on tap for places like Cincinnati, close to 70 in Nashville, well into the 70s and close to 80 uh, as you look down towards the south through the day today. That taste of spring continues tomorrow, too. Across much of the east, we'll end up into the upper 50s to low 60s, mid 60s on tap for Charlotte uh, as we get into to tomorrow and you can see we really do keep it above normal here for the next two days before we start to see things kind of change up that's when we see temperatures take a bit of a tumble we'll start to turn cooler by the time the week really wraps up we end up into the 50s for both thursday and friday in chicago but notice the 40s return by saturday similar story for st louis we end up back into the 50s guys by the time we get into the weekend of course all good things come to an end back over <laughs> <to> you <laughs> thank you Angie. Angie. Likewise. Yeah, coming up Multiple explosions lit up the skies of Michigan overnight. What's behind the incident at an industrial site near Detroit and why officials have been urging residents to stay inside? That's next. We are back now with a developing story out of eastern Michigan. Multiple explosions and a fire broke out at an industrial site north of Detroit late Monday night. The blasts were so powerful, debris was sent flying as far as a mile away. Now officials are asking people to avoid the area as they try to get the situation under control. NBC News correspondent Adrian Broadus is near the scene and joins us with the latest. Adrian, good morning. 
Joe, good morning to you. A terrifying scene here in this Michigan community. Moments ago, we learned a 19-year-old was killed. That 19-year-old male was injured after this series of explosions. The chief of the fire department saying containers like this filled with butane and other gases were flying through the air, falling like raindrops. And now the investigation continues into what started that explosion. Overnight, massive explosions lighting up the sky in Michigan, causing a massive factory fire at an industrial site about 25 miles outside Detroit. Please, we got multiple explosions and a lot of debris in the air. Authorities say the blaze erupted at a plant which distributes vape products and other items in Michigan's Clinton Township. Debris projected into the air, traveling as far as a mile away. As canisters became projectiles, residents were asked to avoid the area, stay inside, and close windows. I want any, any people standing around videotaping in their cars that are anywhere near the station cleared out immediately. Neighbors describe hearing a loud bang, which sounded like fireworks shaking the ground. Social media posts showing images of huge plumes of fire and smoke billowing from the site. Clinton Township Police releasing a statement saying, quote, Upon arrival, officers observed exploding materials flying in all directions from the building. Police also writing on Facebook, please, please, please stay inside. Bigger concern right now is uh, obviously they're taming the fire, but now you know, what's going on with that air quality? Emergency crews working throughout the night to put out the blaze as residents waited for the flames to die down. And even this morning, about an hour ago, there was another explosion. Before that explosion, the last one was at 3 a.m. Behind me, you see the pile of rubber. That's all that's left of the building. The good news, the fire chief says the air quality, which was a concern, is okay. Joe? Adrian, thank you so much. Get some other international headlines now, starting with a warning from North Korea in response to joint military drills by the U.S. and South Korea. NBC's Claudia Lavanga has that and other world news. Claudia, good morning. Good morning, guys. That's right. The day after the South Korea and the U.S. started their annual joint military drills, North Korea says that those exercises are part of a plot to invade their country. Now, in a statement, the defense ministry of North Korea said, and I quote, it strongly denounces the reckless military drills of the U.S. and South Korea for getting more undisguised in their military threats to a sovereign state, an attempt for invading it. North Korea also threatened to take unspecified military steps in response. Response. The joint drills by South Korea and the U.S. will last 11 days and will involve 48 field exercises, twice the number conducted last year. Let's now go to France, which on Monday became the first country in the world to enshrine abortion rights in its constitution after lawmakers in both houses of parliament voted overwhelmingly in favor of the measure. Now, the decision to enshrine abortion in the Constitution in France was triggered by the U.S. Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade and will send a strong message to other countries in Europe, like Hungary, where reproductive rights are under threat. Following the vote, the Eiffel Tower was lit up with the words, my body, my choice. And let's end this tour of the world in Britain, where police recovered a Ferrari three decades after it was stolen in Italy. The red Ferrari belonged to for former Formula One driver Gerard Berger and was one of two sports cars stolen in 1995. The breakthrough came in January this year when a manufacturer noticed that the car, which was going to be sold to an American buyer, had been flagged as a stolen vehicle. Officers seized the car worth almost half a million dollars. Now a very, very fast car and a very, very slow return home. Back to you guys. <laughs> yeah. okay. Wow, it's exciting for them. Claudia Lavanga, thank you so much. Coming up, a landmark moment for reproductive health care. What you need to know about the first over-the-counter birth control pills to hit shelves later this month. That's up next. Welcome back. Over-the-counter birth control pills are expected to hit shelves at major retailers across the country by the end of the month. 
Opil, as it's called, was approved for sale by the FDA last summer. It will be the first daily oral contraceptive approved for use in the U.S. without a prescription. Dr. Lucky Seacon joins us for more on this. She is a double board certified reproductive endocrinologist and OBGYN at RMA of New York Fertility Clinic. And of course, a friend of the show, Dr. Seacon, always great to have you with us. Good morning. So why is this considered such a landmark moment for reproductive care in the U.S.? This is revolutionary for reproductive health because this is the first non-prescription over-the-counter birth control pill that has ever been made available in the United States. And this follows at least 100 other countries around the world that have made this type of uh, contraception available. And it's going to increase access to care for a lot of people. Tell us more details here before people start purchasing them in stores. Are these covered by insurance companies? Is this going to be available across the country? What are the details? This is going to be available across the country. It's hitting shelves this month, and it was formally approved as an over-the-counter non-prescription contraception last summer. And it's actually not a novel or new medication. This is the progestin-only birth control pill. So the standard birth control pill that most people think about when you hear people talking about the pill contains usually estrogen and progesterone. And that's not always suitable for everyone, people who have uncontrolled hypertension, blood clots, different types of migraines shouldn't be taking estrogen containing birth control. This is a much safer, more inclusive form of birth control that only contains progestin. And there are fewer contraindications. And this is one of the reasons why the FDA felt it was the safest version of birth control pill to make available over the counter. Who might benefit from having access to these pills without needing to head to a doctor's office or get a prescription written? Well, depending on who you are and where you live in the country, it's not always so easy to have access um, to a doctor and to, to get in for a visit and then wait to have a prescription. So this is great for anyone who's waiting to get in to see a doctor. It's an immediate way to start contracepting and avoid an unplanned pregnancy. It's also helpful to people who are trying to avoid the copay of an office visit. Um, it's also very discreet. There's really no age limit to who can access the OPIL. And so this is going to be a game changer for adolescents and teenagers who otherwise might have a hard time having access to contraception. And doctor, for people who have seen a doctor before for this type of medication, and like you said, there's lots of different types. Is there a reason why someone would cut out the doctor and just go straight to a pharmacy themselves? What should people think about? Is there a reason why you might not want to be on this particular birth control? I mean, there are differences and potential downsides to taking a progestin-only pill. Um, there is a little bit less wiggle room in terms of when you need to take this. This is only an effective form of contraception if taken at the exact same time every day. And if it's any later than three hours than your usual time that you administer it, then you really need to make sure that you have a backup form of contraception for at least 48 hours. Otherwise, the failure rate does increase compared to estrogen-containing birth control pills. All right, Dr. Lucky Seacon, great information. Thank you so much. More and more people are turning to weight loss drugs to help them lose weight, and that is having an impact on many businesses. Yeah, it's already shaken up the diet and snack food industries. Well, now it's starting to reshape how gyms and fitness clubs are trying to win over members. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa is here in studio with more on this. Hey, Emily, good morning. Hey, guys, it just continues to have a sweeping impact. You think about it, as many as tens of millions of Americans could be taking weight loss drugs by 2028, according to Goldman Sachs. Their soaring popularity has gyms, which have long relied on people hoping to shed pounds, adjusting their strategies. As weight loss drugs soar in popularity and make shedding pounds easier than ever. I have worked out three to five times a week since being on this medication. America's gyms are working up a sweat to assure they're not left behind in this new age of health and wellness. We're now trying to figure out how can we assist people in getting the best possible results. Equinox is among the fitness clubs leaning in, launching curated training programs for members on weight loss drugs. People need to maintain a really good exercise regimen and a, a nutrition regimen on top of it. Exponential Fitness acquired a chain of weight loss medical clinics, while Lifetime is piloting an on-site clinic that provides access to doctors who can prescribe weight loss medications to eligible members. 
While some trainers say they're losing clients to weight loss drugs, many industry analysts believe gyms, luxury or not, stand to benefit. Planet Fitness calling the drugs a tailwind for our industry. 40 pounds ago, this girl was not going into a Pilates class. As some patients find new confidence to start working out. It's super important to try to build your muscle. And look to stave off muscle loss, a potential side effect of such medications. Doctors say those taking weight loss drugs should stay in touch with the healthcare team to monitor any potential side effects, practice strength training like body weight squats and resistance bands, and avoid exercising on an empty stomach. What's at stake for those who do not do any strength training on these kinds of drugs? If you don't move your body and you don't do some resistance activity, you're at risk for uh, losing more of the muscle mass as we age and we lose that muscle mass that we're going to have you know, more troubles and more issues over time. Dr. Angela Fitch says nausea is a common initial side effect of the drugs and that new patients should take exercise slow at first. I felt I had a little bit of nausea and within a week after taking it, probably my second shot, I felt a lot better. I started my workout routine again. So we talk about this issue of preventing muscle loss. We know obviously strength training can help. Can nutrition help at all with that? Yeah, absolutely. That's the other important pillar here. And when it comes to nutrition, you think of one word, it's protein, especially when there's concerns about muscle loss, when someone is rapidly losing weight. And so a couple of things that you can keep in mind and should look for in adding to your diet. If you're really rapidly losing weight, uh, consider doctors say protein supplements, make sure they are lower in sugar, but then also just like lean meats, chicken, fish, vegetables are good options as well to really pack that diet with protein. But I think this all just goes to show that there's no silver bullet for weight loss and it all goes back to taking a well-rounded approach to health and wellness. Mm. Always right. good advice. Mm -hmm. Emily, thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys so much. Coming up, Super Tuesday isn't the only vote we're watching today. That's right. The Dartmouth College basketball team is voting on whether to form a union. More on that and what it could mean for college sports all across the country when Morning News Now continues. Time now for financial headlines and a surge in the price of Bitcoin. CNBC Savannah Hanau has that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Good morning. Yes, yeah, so Bitcoin, it is pulling back today, but this is after topping $68,000 yesterday, nearing its all-time high around $69,000. So the cryptocurrency is closing in on the market value of silver at roughly $1.4 trillion. Investor enthusiasm for Bitcoin has picked up steam since the SEC approved several exchange-traded funds that track the spot price. BlackRock's ETF, the iShares Bitcoin Trust, has racked up more than $10 billion in assets in just two months. Meanwhile, Jeff Bezos overtakes Elon Musk as the world's richest person for the first time since 2021. It's also the first time Musk has lost the top spot in the Bloomberg Billionaires Index in nine months when the CEO of LVMH, Bernard Arnault, briefly surpassed him. Now, Bezos' net worth is estimated at $200 billion, topping Musk at $198 billion. Musk's fortune has dropped by $31 billion this year as Tesla stock has lost a quarter of its value. Bezos recently sold about 50 million shares of Amazon worth roughly $8 billion. And Cookie Monster is weighing in on the economy. The iconic Sesame Street character is expressing his dismay at shrinkflation. In a post on X, Cookie Monster says he's feeling the pain of high prices, which have led to the downsizing of certain consumer goods. He says, me hate shrinkflation. Me cookies are getting smaller. Guess me going to have to eat double the cookies. So the chief <laughs> economist at Jobsite Glassdoor responded by posting a chart showing cookie prices <laughs> are up nearly 30% since, since the pandemic, which he says is, well, tough for somebody whose consumption basket is 100% cookies. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm very impressed. <laughs> Silvana, thank you so much. You you guys. Guys. <laughs> right. Today may be Super Tuesday, but there's another election we're closely watching that has nothing to do with politics. In New Hampshire, the 15 members of the Dartmouth College men's basketball team will vote today to potentially form the first ever union in college sports. The results could change college sports forever. NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett has more. Kate Haskins and Romeo Myrtle are like most students at Dartmouth. Every day is work and school, school and work. Except the work they do doesn't come with a paycheck. 
Why? Because they're on the men's basketball team. We don't get a stipend or any type of benefit for being athletes, even though we are, you know, working like full-time jobs basically by being on the team. The only way college athletes can get money for playing is through what's called name, image, and likeness. Basically, it lets players earn money for things like autographs, appearances, coaching, merch, video games, or endorsements, just not directly for what they do on the field. Some, like Southern California's Bronny James or LSU's Livy Dunn, can rack up big bucks. But those opportunities opportunities don't exist for every athlete. That's why Haskins and Myrtle decided to form a union to get compensated like other student employees with hourly wages similar to other student wages on campus or scholarships. Both players have had to take on what are essentially third jobs. Haskins has experience with unions though, helping start one at the dining hall on campus. We just saw the impacts and how influential their voices became um, once they actually became a union. There's a lot more power. Athletes have tried this before. The here was seeking to form a labor union. Back in 2015, the National Labor Relations Board rejected Northwestern football's bid to form a union. But a decade later, a shift. Now, the NLRB is backing their bid, ruling the men's basketball team performs work in exchange for compensation in the form of gear, food, lodging, and tickets, since Ivy League athletes don't get scholarships. Dartmouth is appealing the ruling, telling NBC News unionization is not appropriate in this instance. The costs of Dartmouth's athletic program far exceed any revenue for the program. But Haskins and Myrtle already have their sights set on something bigger, overturning the whole system. At the core of all of this, it challenges the the term that we see so often in the conference of you guys being student athletes. What do you make of that term? Do you agree with it? I mean, no, it's a it's an old term and it was used to kind of keep the, the athletes as students first and kind of de-emphasize the athlete part of it and the fact that they actually do work for the college. Sports law expert Michael McCann says these rulings could put the entire NCAA on notice. It's a game changer for college sports. So there would be a fundamental shift in the NCAA's model from a model where by rule the schools cannot pay the athletes and that makes them amateurs. College players are, have a big role in terms of generating revenue, uh, generating fundraising, generating admissions. So schools might rethink some of their numbers. The NCAA has not responded to our request for comment, but it has a key factor working in its favor. Public schools like Alabama, Ohio State, and Michigan aren't covered by the NLRB, so there's no sign athletes at those schools could form unions yet. But more than a third of the D1 schools are private, leaving them wide open to take that step. For Haskins and Myrtle, they're now focusing on bringing together the whole Ivy League under one roof. We're not the only ones frustrated with the Ivy League and uh, with our own school. It's, it's everybody. You know, everyone feels like we're being used in the Ivy League, and, and we want to make we want to change that. Thanks to Maura Barrett for that report. If the players vote in favor of a union, Dartmouth can still appeal to the full National Labor Relations Board and then to the federal courts. So it could be years before players can negotiate a collective bargaining agreement with the school. Coming up, it is the end of an era for one NFL star. Jason Kelsey, he's calling it quits after 13 years. We'll bring you his emotional announcement and why he's decided to hang up his cleats. Stay with us. Welcome back. Taylor Swift has a new album on the way. It's called The Tortured Poets Department. But it turns out she is not the only poet in the family. According to the genealogy company Ancestry, Swift and the treasured American poet Emily Dickinson are sixth cousins three times removed. Ancestry shared that the pair are descended from a 17th century English immigrant who lived in Connecticut for six generations before Taylor's part of the family moved to Pennsylvania and married into the Swift family line. Swifties have long speculated Dickinson's influence on her album Evermore, with Swift's lyrics often hinting at lines from Dickinson's poems. So, you know, Joe, I guess the lyrical genius apple doesn't fall far from the family tree. That's true. I, I guess, isn't That's everyone true. sixth cousins three times removed? I know. And what is that? And I never, what does the removed thing mean? I never remember that I don't that know part. either. Yeah. But it's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. There's something right. there, yeah. All right. We end this hour with the end of an incredible career. It is now official. During an emotional press conference yesterday, Philadelphia Eagles star center Jason Kelsey announced he's retiring from the game, capping off a storied career that had an impact both on and on and off the field. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung has reactions from fans and his teammates. 
Hey there, Joe and Savannah. Jason Kelsey was in tears before he even began reading his prepared statement. It was a retirement speech unlike any other. He thanked everyone from his high school band teacher to football coaches at every level and, of course, his beloved family. Kelsey will go down in NFL history of one of the greatest centers to ever play the game, but his impact on the Eagles franchise, the city of Philadelphia, and the NFL is immeasurable. With an emotional farewell, Jason Kelsey's 13-year NFL career comes to an end. This all brings us here to today, where I announce that I am retiring. The 36-year-old making the announcement with his family in attendance. Brother Travis wiping away tears during the heartfelt speech. There is no chance I'd be here without the bond Travis and I share. It's only too poetic I found my career being fulfilled in the city of brotherly love. An unlikely hero in Philadelphia, the Eagles drafted Kelsey in 2011 as the 191st selection. But with dogged determination, he would help guide the franchise to their first ever Super Bowl title in 2018. The long drought is over. His rock is showing at their victory parade, cementing Kelsey as a Philly icon. Then, five years later, the Star Center's fame reached new heights. As brothers faced off against each other for the first time in Super Bowl history, the game dubbed the Kelsey Bowl. I won't forget falling short to the Chiefs and the conflicted feeling of immense heartbreak I had selfishly. And at the same time, the amount of pride I had that my brother had climbed the mountaintop once again. That matchup putting a spotlight on the Kelsey family with mom Donna at the helm. I won't forget my mother becoming mom of the NFL. The announcement coming after months of speculation. When the Eagles season ended in disappointing fashion, Kelsey turned into the ultimate cheerleader for his brother through the playoffs. Oh, there's his brother. His antics going viral, celebrating alongside Taylor Swift after the Chiefs Super Bowl win last month. As he closes the chapter on his NFL career with accolades piled high, Kelsey's family, the center of his world. I have enjoyed my best years of my career with Kylie by my side. She has also given me three beautiful girls and a life that increasingly brings me more fulfillment off the field than it does on. Kelsey giving the Bird Gang his final thanks before flying the coop. Thank you, Philadelphia. From the bottom of my heart. So it's getting a little misty in here, guys. Uh, Jason says he's not sure what the future will hold, but there's no question he's comfortable in front of the camera. And we know he's spoken with sports networks about the possibility of going the analyst route. He's also mentioned he's open to coaching at either the pro or even high school level. And Eagles head coach Nick Sirianni has also said there will always be a place for Jason in Philadelphia. Guys. All right, Kaylee, thank you so much. Hard to believe we're never going to have another Kelsey Super Bowl, I know. first of all. Oh, which... my gosh. Can you imagine if he was your high school football coach? <laughs> He'd be like the best epic. coach. That is so epic. <laughs> also, I loved something else that wasn't in there that he said about his wife. He described, like, the first moment he remembers seeing her walk through the door and everything. It was just so Aww. sweet. And the whole family was just sobbing. <laughs> we're going to see him in a million advertisements. So he's yeah. not going anywhere either. You will see him either. and we can listen to their podcast still. Exactly. She, of course, has lots of new Swifty fans. So, anyway. All right, our thanks again to Kaylee for that. Well, now a reminder before we go, we will have coverage of Super Tuesday throughout the day here on NBC News Now. And then tonight we've got extensive live coverage that gets underway at 5 p.m. Eastern to Pacific Time. Be sure to tune in. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us, though. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.